What's up, friends? Welcome to Web3 Academy, a place for entrepreneurs, creators, and marketers to explore and learn how to use Web3 to transform business models and create thriving communities. Enjoy this next episode. GM, GM. Welcome, Web3 doers. It's the Web3 Academy Weekly Doer Spotlight. Uh, I'm Jay Hamilton, uh, coming at you today from Muskoka, Ontario. Uh, and as always, my co host is with me. What's up, Kai? How's it going, guys? I'm just a couple hours from you in uh, London, Ontario. So finally back in Canada and excited to be here. Well, that, that's where that's where each of us is in the metaverse today, <laughs> or, or the real verse. We'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, today on the podcast, we have Evan McMullen with us. Evan is the founder of Disco XYZ and a core member, community member at the Boys Club. Evan is working on the world of verifiable credentials and decentralized identifiers. She's a devoted advocate of privacy and consent, which are what she believes are the key ingredient to creating an off-chain decentralized identity system, which preserves user sovereignty. Welcome, Evan. GM, GM. So glad to be with you guys today. So, so excited to have you here. And wow, like so, so much to discuss and dive into, but before we do, I know you were at NFT NYC last week, which I was as well. Uh, how, how are you feeling coming out of that? It was a very inspiring week. Um, the feedback that I took away was that we built it and they came, but now we need something for everyone to do because mm-hmm. throwing down drinks from an open bar, standing next to JPEGs is not the apex of what we came here to build. <laughs> I'm glad you said that. <laughs> it's very, very well said. Yeah, I think my my main takeaway is just how early we are. We are so, so early. And it was amazing to see the diversity of knowledge, of Web3 knowledge that was there. There was, you know, early OGs building, and there was a lot of people. I was really surprised with how many people were there who are just getting into the space and uh, just learning right at the be- right at the beginning of their journey. It was it, really exciting to see that diversity. But the other thing is, it's amazing how fr- it was the most friendly conference. I come from a corporate world. You know, a decade ago, I was a management consultant, uh, and conferences were dry and boring. <laughs> and the only fun part was the open bar at those conferences. To be honest, uh, but this was. Web3 is so collaborative, so friendly. Everyone is so excited to meet each other. It's, uh, it was really inspiring. I think there is something to be said for the substrate that all of us are standing on top of and why it is that the friendliness and collaboration of Web3 is different than mm-hmm. Web2, where a competitive moat is hoarding your knowledge. So because we are building an open composable networks, we necessarily need one another to complete a full stack. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you nailed it. I think that that core layer is really what allows us to build in this different different way. Uh, okay, let's. I want to start by asking you about your love for the Jetsons because <laughs> I've heard that you love the Jetsons, uh, which I also loved the Jetsons when I was younger. Um, and and I I feel like that might lead into you know your feelings about the metaverse, the metaverse and about this space. Uh, so. Uh, I'm curious, tell us about your love for the Jetsons. When did that start? And how does that sort of show up for you today? So when I was a kid, I was not allowed to watch TV. Hmm. But as a special treat, sometimes when I visited my grandmother, we would be allowed to watch cartoons. And so Hmm. that is where I first discovered the Jetsons and the Flintstones, but specifically the Jetsons uh, took hold of my imagination because they lived in a world where they could just show up in any environment and it would respond to them. You know, Elroy would be Mm. riding to school with his parents in their spaceship and his little space pod would just flop out of the spaceship and, you know, fly over to the school and attach. And so from a technical perspective, the Jetsons either live in an authoritarian society with a centralized entity controlling access between all these space pods and all of these individuals and identities, or they live in a self-custodied, open, permissionless metaverse where everyone's identity can represent their privileges and allow them access. So I like to think that the future they're building, the future that they lived in, was more of the latter than the former. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay, so is that what you thought about when you watched the Jetsons, Jay? 
<laughs> no, definitely not. No, definitely not. Evan is way smarter than I am. <laughs> I will say, I will say the Jetsons is on HBO. So oh, really? the time that y'all are doing your laundry, cleaning up the house around, you know, Saturday or Sunday morning, put it on in the background because the number of um, silly storylines and random characters that align with the ideas that we're pursuing in web three are pretty uncanny. So for example, there's an episode where the dog Astro, uh, turns out he was adopted from a wealthy space leader, um, and, and perhaps might not actually belong to the Jetsons. And so in this process, they bring in the governator, which are the, the governatron or something like that. It's just like a machine that programmatically determines governance and the, and mm. applies guidance to different situations. So what does this feel like? It feels like the governance system of a DAO where we might programmatically determine outcomes based on inputs and the roles that different people have. Um, so I know it sounds a little bit goofy, but the, the Jetsons really informed my understanding of what the metaverse could be. So I'm sold. I'm watching an episode. Yeah, it was definitely. So, <laughs> spe spe speaking about the metaverse, we, we mentioned this quickly before we started recording. So I want to get it on, on the, the record. Uh, you had a great definition for what the metaverse is. What, what is that? So at Disco, we believe that the metaverse is your ability to show up in any digital or physical environment and receive a personalized experience as a result of the parts of yourself that you choose to share. That is why we are called Disco, because we believe that you are the shining center of the party just as you are, and you should mm -hmm. reflect your data and your identity to the world however you choose. Beautiful mm -hmm. definition. Yeah, fantastic definition. I like, I like the idea that you are the center of it is, is really a, it's not actually what I, I haven't heard that view in many metaverse definitions. Um, what, one more definition, just because you're so great at giving definitions, Evan, uh, what's your def definition for web three? Uh, we always, we, we always are trying to explain web three and trying to explain it to, um, a both, people currently in the space, but also to, you know, our parents who have no idea what this space is about. Uh, curious to, to get your definition of Web3. So my definition of Web3 is the universe of fun that we can unlock when we have self-custody mm -hmm. and global public consensus. So these two superpowers, the ability to own and control things with our own keys under our own consent, and the ability to publish data for everyone on earth and in space with an internet connection for all time to be able to access, that these two capabilities unlock a pretty significant breadth of activities that we could not do before. Mm. That's very good. Wow. It's so hard to get the definition of Web3 into like a couple sentences, like the elevator pitch. We were trying to do it in our, in our Discord community and it was like, everyone had some great ideas, but it's still, I was like, ah, we didn't nail it just yet, but that was pretty good. Thank you for that. I really love the way that Chris Dixon has characterized read, write, own, mm -hmm. um, but, and, and sort of ownership necessarily is predicated on global public consensus, because if we don't agree how many things there are, we can't know who has the things. Mm -hmm. um, but I think extending that definition to uh, read, write, own, and agree is valuable. Mm. Interesting. Mm. I still don't know, like I had... I'm back in, in London, like I said in the beginning of this, uh, at my parents' place and seeing friends who are not at all involved in tech and especially not Web3. And they were asking, what the heck is Web3 Academy? What am I doing? And I was like, oh my God, I don't know how to explain this. Even the read, write, own, they didn't understand. They were like, I don't get it. You know, they're still just like, what does that, what does that really mean? Uh, so I, I still feel like we need to simplify even further. We need to go even deeper, but I'm going to keep, keep, keep trying to figure out how to do that. I think you make a really excellent point here that there is only so much we can do by explaining. I can right. tell you how to bake a cake. I can tell you every detail in excruciating precision. I can read every single direction from one of the cookbooks that my laptop is sitting on top of right now. But you won't know what it's like to make a cake until you smell that delicious baking, mm. um, you know, goodness come out of the oven. You're not going to know what it's like to bake a cake until you get frustrated trying to frost a cake that's too warm and the frosting gets caught. You're not going to know what it's like to, to, you know, taste the deliciousness that you've made with your own hand until you stick your fork in a layer cake of your own creation. And so we can tell people what it's like to own things all day, but until they have the sensation 
of taking custody of a digital asset that belongs to only them, we're just mm. going to be describing what it's like to bake a cake. Mm -hmm. True. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. We need, they just need to experience it, which is so true. Even myself getting into the space, it was like, once I started using this stuff, I was like, oh, there's the aha moments, right? Um, yeah, that's a great point. Yes. Yeah, so let them eat cake. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> Everybody, Web3 <laughs> Academy actually just bakes cakes. Uh, so uh, call us up. We'll deliver you a cake in the metaverse uh, and you can have self-custody of it forever. Uh, okay, let's let's start with how, how did you first experience Web3, Evan? Take us, take us to sort of the beginning of your rabbit hole journey. So my rabbit hole journey started before I had, I knew the word web three. <laughs> um, I, so when I was really young, I first learned about the idea of digital ownership, um, through Napster file sharing, mm -hmm. things like LimeWire and BearShare. Uh, my father's an intellectual property attorney who specializes in identity tools and digital media. And so mm -hmm. when I was a kid, I had to make a presentation to my parents about the fair use statute and why my non-commercial educational music downloading constituted a legal use of this exception and would not violate the intellectual property protections of the artists whose music I wanted to listen to. So uh, that was, you know, my first your encounter. parents are the coolest. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> really are. Hi, mom and dad. So they really are the coolest. So, um, so that was my first encounter with Black's Law Dictionary. But then later on, a few years later, I showed up in undergrad, wandered into a computer science senior seminar that I had no business being in, and had, I met the greatest professor of all time in the whole galaxy, a woman named Elizabeth Stark, who many of your listeners may know as the leader of Lightning Labs over in the Bitcoin mm -hmm. ecosystem, uh, Bitcoin payments queen. But at the time, she was the coolest computer science teacher I'd ever met. And she brought in her friends who were entrepreneurs to teach us what it was like to build a business. And she invited us to read texts like John Perry Barlow's Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace. And she introduced us to you know, writers and, and theorists like Larry Lessig and Jonathan Zittrain, Clay Shirky and Tim Wu. And so this opened my eyes to the intersection of remix culture, law, and the technology that we were using to build these new, new ideas. Um, and, and so it was sort of through that lens that I learned about free and open source software, that I learned about Creative Commons licenses, the work that was being done at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard, at the Yale Information Society Project. And that is what led me um, you know, through, through uh, Stark's tutelage uh, to the universe of Bitcoin, um, which was so fascinating and exciting to me. I thought it was a technical representation of so many of these ideas of true ownership that we were stumbling around trying to get at through legal rappers. Um, and so that was what began my Web3 journey, but it was really through the ensuing years of nights and weekends. You know, I was working first in film and content production, then I was working mm. in hardware engineering and design, um, but spent a lot of time lurking around on Reddit, showing up at hackathons, tricking my girlfriend, saying that we were going to parties with cool boys, but actually pulling up to like <laughs> weekend long hackathons at, at uh, warehouses in Bushwick. <laughs> Sorry, Lexi. Um, but uh, but that sort of fascination where I realized I was spending so much of my free time playing with this stuff. I was onboarding folks at my, you know, sort of well-known web two job uh, at the water cooler to Coinbase so that mm -hmm. I could talk to them about crypto, even though we were working in, you know, the halls of TradFi. Um, and so it was that point that I realized like, okay, we got to go pro. This is taking up way too much of my brain space. It is the only thing that I can think about. And it feels like the most important thing we could be working on together right now. Mm. I love Incredible. It. I love it. So let's let's dive into you're now solving uh, one of the probably the biggest problems I think that's happening in the internet, uh, which is around data and privacy and identity uh, and all that kind of stuff. So before we get into what Disco is and like what the solution is or what you guys believe the solution is, um, can you just sort of walk us through like what's the current state in regards to identity in I guess the Web two world and why is this a problem? Uh, and just sort of give me like your your um, overview of what's happening right now in the space and why you feel the need to build and, and try to solve something in this area. So today, you are not the expert on yourself. <laughs> Some random dude who made an app that you use sometimes has better data about you than you do. That's pretty weird, right? In the rest of your life, the things that you create your work product, your value, your personhood, your physical self, those things belong to you, 
right? This hair on my head, I grew it, belongs to me. And so very strange that the data that I create when I ride my Peloton bike does not belong to me. Um, we are in an account and profile based ecosystem where we are a different person to every party that we interact with. The Evan that I am when I use my Costco membership card is basically divorced from the Evan that I am when I go mm -hmm. to a Dylan Francis show than the Evan that I am when I tune into a Seed Club demo day. And so because the only data I can bring with me from one environment to another is data that I self-report, it's not super trustworthy or useful. So for example, when I create a Discord handle, I could create the same handle I have on Twitter, or I could not. But if you see that same name on both platforms, you might think it's actually me. And this has landed a lot of people in a lot of hot water, um, speaking to uh, you know counterfeit individuals on various platforms trying to get at their NFTs. Um, and so in Web2, our role in the app ecosystem is to labor, to produce data that is then consumed by apps and sold to other parties without our consent and participation. So we are generating the work product monetized by others that mm -hmm. is not subject to our participation and our consent. That's pretty weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it leaves us, uh, I mean, it, it leaves us in a position where, as you said, we are the product. And I think there's, there's pretty big consequences for privacy that we're not, I mean, we are discussing them and it's come out a lot more in the past decade, uh, but I don't think that most people even realize how much data there is about us. And I think you're the way you put it of the, you know, we grew our own hair, but for some reason we didn't, we don't own our own data is it's, it really brings into picture how much is out there that is not within our control. And then what's, what's happening with that data and how it's being used is for, for profit for these big web two companies, uh, and so we're, we're missing out on a lot of opportunity, I think, of interoperability and data integrity that is not, um, yeah, not currently in the ethos or the culture of the systems that we've built in Web2. So absolutely. I let, think let, just to jump in for, for a quick second, I think there are, there are two things that you've pointed out that are, that are really salient here. You know, one is that um, there are a number of, you know, of unexpected um, ways that our data turns up and, uh, and influences us. Mm -hmm. So if I have your phone number with about an 80 to 90% assurance, I can pretty much figure out a lot of other data about you, where you live, where you've been shopping, what sites you've signed up for. Um, if you've never spoken to a woman who's had to remove her data from Google because of an abusive ex, it is an arduous process to learn about. Uh, there are a number of ways where, you know, buying tickets online for an event, ordering clothing from an Instagram store can unexpectedly leak our location information about us and how we're interacting. When that information is made available on a public market to people who wish us ill, things can get really scary. Um, and, and perhaps more, more specifically here in the United States this week, um, Roe versus Wade, which protects reproductive health rights for uh, uterus owning individuals in the United States was overturned. So what this means is that in states where abortion is no longer legal, people can be prosecuted for failing to deliver a healthy baby. And the challenges that, that face people like me in this position are that the data we create with our internet browsing, our video watching, our social interactions on social media, our e-commerce and shopping, even our location can all be used to prosecute us if we are pursuing our reproductive health in a way that is you know, optimally safe for our bodies. And so the data leakage that we experience in Web2 is becoming increasingly dangerous for the safety of individuals. So for all those who love self-custody, for all those who are excited about a self-owned future in Web3, this is the moment where the rubber hits the road and this technology needs to protect our people because otherwise there are going to be very significant consequences. Yeah, I you, know, agree you, more. You, you brought up some very, very significant examples there with Roe versus Wade, yeah, it's... It's, it's it's scary to think about what what could happen to you for just living your life the way you believe you should live your life and the, the yeah the consequences are are huge so let's let's talk about 
Okay, so what why why does Web3 solve the identity issue? How is how does it how does it make it better? And again, sort of stay high level for, for a bit here. Totally. So as we discussed in Web2, we don't own the data that we generate. That's why for every party that we went to at NFT NYC this week, we had to fill out a separate form. Yeah. Filling in our name, our email address, <laughs> our phone number, our organization of affiliation, how who invited us to the party. And so for every time we reproduce data that we've already created before, we are doing duplicate work that mm -hmm. takes more time. It takes more effort and it creates an extra clear text copy of our data that is floating around in yet another repository. Mm -hmm. And so in web three, what we can enjoy is in the same way that we own and control our money in a wallet, we can own and control the rest of ourselves in a backpack. So imagine in real life, we carry around our backpacks and they contain an extra layer of clothing, maybe our keys, our, um, you know, our chapstick, other things that we need for our adventures through the physical world. And in the metaverse, we're going to need more than just financial data to show up in different environments and receive personalized experiences. We're going to need the ability to collect our accomplishments, to have proofs of the communities where we contribute, to even you know have the ability to complete our address when we're receiving, uh, when we're, we're ordering something online to receive it in the mail so that we don't have to type it in again. But rather than Google Forms version of this, where Google owns and controls all of that data, instead, we can be the ones owning and controlling our data. So what this means for interoperability is that if I capture the data that I create in a form that just about every blockchain can read, I'm not going to have to mess with a bridge when I want to move information from one context to another. I'm not going to have to pay gas fees if I want to be able to interact with another party using that data. And I'm not going to need to worry about whether it has relevance in the place where I'm bringing it because I know that it was captured in a universally legible form. Mm. So digital ownership is is so important here for data. And we talk about this all the time on the show, to be honest. We're always talking about how we see the future of identity being something to do with Web3, where it's in a wallet and we can have our credentials and we can have our data and it'll be interoperable and all this. But you've really highlighted, and I've watched a lot of your videos and I also was at Permissionless Conference, so I heard you speak there as well. Um, you've highlighted some issues with Web3, right? Like a lot of us think about these sort of like non-transferable or soul-bound NFTs. Uh, and this is where we can, you know, have our credentials and have, um, you know, our data and things like that inside of a wallet on-chain. But you've highlighted some issues with that. Um, can you just sort of walk us through the issues you're seeing of kind of the, the current solutions, I guess you could call it, that are happening Web3 for, for identity? And then we can get into the solutions that, um, that you're creating over, over with Disco. Absolutely. So to kind of bring us back to first principles, basics, um, in Web3, when we use public blockchains, there is no consent layer for our wallets. So what that means is that if I want to send you a token, I can do so without your permission, which is what makes this whole thing go round. But it's also the reason that someone was able to airdrop billions of dollars of Shiba token into Vitalik's wallet, and he was immediately <laughs> responsible for the tax consequences, whether he liked it or not. And so without a consent layer of tokens incoming to be mapped to our public address, um, the autonomy of our keys comes from our ability to separate that which we do not want from our address. So no permission incoming, but we can send things away that we don't want. And so that's why it's so important that we have private keys. Now, if our ability to send a token away is diminished or indeed inhibited altogether, it kind of undermines the point of having those private keys in the first place. If other people can decide how my address presents and I no longer have autonomy over how to show up in the world, then what's the point of me even having these keys to manage my own identifier if I'm not really in control anyway? Mm. And so from a first principles perspective, I struggle to understand how marrying data to a single network that is intended for use across hundreds of networks is optimally efficient. You know, as long as Ethereum is not the only API upon which humanity relies, it will not make sense to me to place human reputational data there if that data is intended to inform experiences across chains and Web2. And when I last checked, I'm still a human being who uses an email address and websites, and Instagram, in addition to playing around with blockchains like Bitcoin, Solano, Polkadot, and Ethereum. And so because my adventures take me from Web 2 to Web 3 and across chains, my data needs to be ready for that adventure too. Hmm. 
So the, the key things here is that your, your data needs to be one interoperable and work across different blockchains, but also just different applications, right? We're, just because we're going into Web3 doesn't mean we only use Ethereum or we only use Solana. We, we're still going to use a lot of what we've built in Web2 that doesn't go away. So that's one big thing. I think the other big point I think you point out is that like these non-transferable NFTs, which I, I think are great, are also could be problematic, as you said, because we don't get to control. Like if someone just wants to throw a non-transferable you know, uh, NFT in our wallet, can't do anything with it, right? We, we can't, we can't get rid of it. And so all of a sudden I plug into OpenSea or someone goes to my wallet and they can just see all these NFTs I have that like, maybe I did not choose to mint or I did not choose to get. Um, and that becomes a problem because like one of the benefits of blockchain is it's public uh, and transparent, but that's also one of the problems of it in terms of data, I think is what you're sort of getting at. Is that correct? Absolutely. And I think it's always very exciting when someone proposes a conjecture for a new way of doing things. It gives us mm -hmm. an opportunity to examine that idea, to explore that idea. Um, however, I think one of the challenges that we run into when we think about modifying transferability is that that's only socially enforceable. Now, what mm -hmm. I mean by that is that if someone suggests a way to modify ERC-721 tokens by removing the transfer function or modifying that transfer function, um, this proposed new way of doing things will only become the accepted methodology if we all just agree. So you can't force people to make sure they secure consent before sending a non-transferable NFT. You can just ask them pretty please. And part of the reason that our public transparent networks um, are such a two-sided coin is that on the one hand, they allow us to have global public immutability in perpetuity and a shared source of truth. On the other hand, it gives me a timestamp for every time someone consumes porn on Spank Chain. And so <laughs> part of the challenge is that there are a lot of private activities or activities that do not, that are not appropriate for, or do not require the whole world to know at once. And so um, to the extent that we do not need global public immutability for certain mm. activities, it feels like a little bit of an expensive overshare. Now, because everybody can see our wallets um, and you know, can see how we are interacting on chain, there are ways for us to unintentionally leak information about ourselves when we do engage in those interactions. So for example, if I am a student at Bennett College, a historically black college and university, uh, mm -hmm. specifically catering toward female students, you'll probably know that I'm a black woman. Now, there's all kinds of bias in our existing ecosystem, in our Web2 world, when we invoke people's race and gender, socioeconomic class alongside their requests for things like undercollateralized loans. So I struggle to understand how we are creating a more equitable ecosystem if we are trying to transpose structures that we already know to be harmful and biased. Similarly, in the 1700s here in the United States, we stopped burning witches and assigning uh, you know, scarlet letters out. We decided we would adopt due process of law with ample opportunity for appeal and that we would put the burden of proof on the accuser and not the accused. And so in this future reputation system that we envision, I invite us all to consider how we might improve upon the system that we already have rather than regressing to principles that we already know to be harmful to human beings. So, so go, for go it, ahead, Jay. Kai. No, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what I want to get into is your solution to a lot of this is to take it off chain, I guess. Um, and it, honestly, I had to listen to you multiple times to really understand what's going on with Disco. Uh, it's, it's very, it, it's deep in the weeds, but it's super exciting. Can you sort of give us the like high level overview of what Disco is, what your solution is to all of this? Uh, and then I want to dive into a lot of questions about Disco because I have many. <laughs> so Disco is your data backpack for the metaverse. We are here to help you collect the data that you create when you make it and keep a copy of it with uh, keep a copy of it with you so that you can carry it with you from one app to another across chains from web 2 to web 3. So what this means is that you'll have to fill out fewer forms, you'll have to fill out fewer captures, wait in fewer lines, and you'll be able to show up in a variety of digital and physical environments pull data out of your backpack that you want to share with the person you're interacting with, and then be able to access unique experiences as a result. So with Disco, we want you to be able to enjoy all of the self-custody and superpowers that you have from owning tokens, but from owning the rest of your data. And 
what sort of data could that be? Can you give some examples? Just walk us through like what, what that means really? Absolutely. So, you know, you are more than the contents of your wallet, right? You're more than the contents of your bank account. You're a whole person. You have a favorite color, a coffee order, a yoga studio that you like to go to, friends that you like to vibe with, you know, bands whose concerts you enjoy, whose hours of music you've listened to, pieces of merchandise you've purchased. You have a favorite order at your favorite restaurant, maybe even a favorite seat on a plane. And so all of these preferences, these accomplishments, proofs of non-financial work you've done, recording this podcast, writing newsletters, getting friends into parties, whatever those actions are that make you, you, you deserve to own them. Mm. Evan, you're a great storyteller. Fantastic. (laughs) I love the way that you speak. Thank you so much. Well, the, the fun thing about all of this, guys, is that like we have all been experts in owning our identities since the day we were born, Mm -hmm. right? Like no one knows more about being Kyle and Jay than Kyle and Jay. And so Except it's for Mark really Zuckerberg. easy, right? <laughs> Except, for Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> Except for Mark Zuckerberg. And so it becomes easier to step into our power when we realize we're just vibing out to our fullest selves and, you know, trying to get in touch with everything that makes us us. And when we break through that barrier of, you know, who owns these parts of myself, just to think about who am I as a person? That exercise, I think, becomes a lot easier and we can zoom out to the kind of mindset that we had as kids when we were watching the Jetsons. Mm. Okay, so how, how do we do this? How does Disco propose to create this digital backpack for all of us? So from a technical perspective, we make it easy for you to use the keys you already have to control the data that is private to you. So if you're a MetaMask user, if you're a Coinbase wallet user, any wallet connect to Ethereum compatible wallet user, soon you'll be able to visit disco.xyz, connect your wallet, we'll create that data backpack for you on the back end, and then you can go off on your Metaverse adventures, collecting data about yourself, sharing data with your friends, sending them uh, invitations to birthday parties, sending them a GM in the morning when you wake up, kind of like a Facebook style poke, Um, being able to interact with them in a manner that's controlled by your keys, but doesn't involve a blockchain in between. So how do we get this whole ecosystem started? Because this is really a three-sided cold start problem. We need Mm -hmm. apps to issue this data into your backpack. We need you to carry your data and your backpack around. And we need other apps to read the data that you pull out of your backpack and give you some awesome experiences. So we are starting off by helping out our friends in the DAO ecosystem, where we're running into a ceiling of utility and fun because the only coordination games we can play with each other are really allocating treasuries together, spending money together. Um, And so in order to uh, abstract the account layers that we need to build reputation, we are at Disco are excited to issue membership credentials attesting to membership in good standing to a handful of DAOs um, that we're really close to that we're really excited to work with. Um, We're going to start off by enabling these DAO members to use their credentials for a variety of different activities to be able to get into events, access tickets, merchandise, online content, Discord channels. So being able to self-custody, self-own a digital proof that you're a member that you can use for multiple different purposes. But unlike an NFT, you can't sell it. So there's no unfettered secondary market to buy your way into the squad. So is is Disco a, is it a, an app or is it more like a foundational layer, like a, a um, almost like a protocol, I guess you could call it, that integrates into all of this stuff and it can, you know, take things that you're doing on the blockchain and then move it over here onto Disco and then other apps can read it. Um, it would you say it's a protocol? Is that kind of how how it works. And then also, if it's not on the chain, it's not on the blockchain, does it still follow the ethos of what we're trying to do in Web3 in terms of like digital ownership and and self-sovereignty? And like, how does that still stay intact if it's not on the blockchain? Like, is it decentralized? Or can you just kind of explain that to me? Great questions. So um, I'll tackle the second one first. I actually think that Disco's approach with data backpacks is more decentralized than putting data on a blockchain. So um, when you store data in your data backpack, it is stored encrypted against your keys, so only you can open it, and it's stored in decentralized storage, so there's no single point of failure for that data. However, if we publish data to a blockchain, that data is very opinionated. It's really only going to be accessible and relevant to those who are interacting in that specific singular blockchain ecosystem, and it means that I'm going to have to create a local cache off the chain 
to allow me to interact with this data. So really I'll just be interacting with the centralized database anyway. So if we wanna optimize for decentralization and we want to hone in on self-custody, ownership of the individual, I think the best way to do that is in a chain and web agnostic form that can be read by email addresses and Solana addresses alike under the ownership and control of the individual. Hmm. So it's, it's connected to our private keys, but where does it live then? So I think it's really important when it comes to identity that you have the choice to decide which names you go by, which mm -hmm. data you collect in your data backpack for every name and where that data lives. So to start off, Disco is encrypting your data against your keys and storing it in Ceramic, which is an awesome decentralized storage solution that utilizes IPFS for pinning from our friends at 3box Labs. We're also mm -hmm. very excited to integrate Privy, Kepler from Spruce ID, as well as Web5 um, from our homies over at Block. And so in order for you to have the maximum freedom and autonomy with your data, you need to be able to choose where that data goes to sleep at night, and you need to be mm -hmm. able to move it if you want. So unlike unstructured data, the verifiable credentials, the encrypted credentials that we put in your data backpack can happily be moved from one location to the next without your need to worry that they're going to be interrupted or corrupted at some point in their journey. I love that. So <clears throat> I think there's a couple of new words that you use that I think we should explain to uh, to the audience. You said verify verifiable credentials. Uh, and then you've also, uh, we've talked about like a decentralized identity, which is essentially what, what uh, Disco is otherwise known as DIDS, I believe we call it. Can you just, uh, <laughs> can you just um, kind of explain what those two are so that we're just, everyone kind of understands the new terminology that we're using here? As with other terms in our world, like dank sharding, I would put these in the uh, nerd vocabulary section. So, um, you know, bear with me for a minute. I did not come up with these terms. So verifiable credentials or credentials that can be independently verified by anyone are a specification, like a recipe from the World Wide Web Consortium. The W3C, these are like the high wizards of the internet, right? These are the folks who determined how our networks are going to work together, how we're going to be able to use the internet. So they are experts in connecting networks that don't talk to each other. So for the last 17 plus more years, they've been working on new ways for our various different networks to communicate. Um, and most recently have come up with some awesome solutions that let more than a hundred blockchains and things like PGP keys, websites, and email addresses all talk together. Like if mm -hmm. you have a Bitcoin address, an email address, and a PGP key in a group chat, and you don't need a bridge, you don't need to pay gas or anything like that. So verifiable credentials are the shared language that all of these different kinds of keys can speak now. The kind of message that can be passed from a Bitcoin address to a Solana address to an email address, and everyone's going to be on the same page. So a verifiable credential is just a signed blob of JSON. It's just a file, like a PDF. Um, it's a statement written by one party about another party or about itself sometimes. Um, and so kind of like a diploma, once it's written about you, it will always be written about you. So I could write a credential about Jay saying we were on this call together. You know, Jay could give that credential to Kyle, but it would still be written about Jay. Um, mm -hmm. And so then it wouldn't, it wouldn't validate in the same way. Unlike an NFT, which is public, immutable, on-chain and transferable, our credentials are going to be off-chain, so they're private by default, so you can decide how much you want to share them. Do you want to share them with no one? Do you want to share them with everyone? But it's under your consent to decide what happens there. Um, they are revocable or can be set to expire. So verifiable credentials are much more appropriate to describe the evolving, changing organic traits that we have as human beings that are not fixed and public. Um, and so in this way, they can provide a lot more flexibility than data on chain can. Um, they are also, uh, they're also because, you know, they, they do not specify a signature scheme. They can be signed by many different kinds of keys. And as I mentioned earlier, can be read by many different kinds of keys. Now, the accompanying element for verifiable credentials, now that we've got our common language that everybody can speak, are decentralized identifiers or DIDs. So these DIDs, DIDs, decentralized identifiers, are also a spec <laughs> from our high wizards of the internet, the W3C, and um, they are like aliases for our existing addresses that allow all of our addresses to talk to each other. So my Bitcoin address 
Uh, I can create a did out of it, create an alias for it, and it can talk to the alias for your Ethereum address. And they're passing verifiable credentials in between them. And so would we have one did or can so, we have many dids? You can have as many dids as you would like. And one thing that's really special about dids, unlike PGP keys, where you can't rotate the keys, we're using public key cryptography, but we can't rotate. Um, with a decentralized identifier, you can roll the keys. So if your keys become compromised, if you lose your keys, you can generate a new set. Um, so mm -hmm. this allows us for perhaps a bit, a bit greater flexibility than we have in other contexts, other kinds of experiences. Um, but overall, the premise of a decentralized identifier is account abstraction. How do we add more capabilities, more functions, more metadata, more privileges and linkages to a set of keys that we get from a blockchain that's really only built to do one thing? So I like to think of a decentralized identifier kind of like... Um, kind of like an extension for the keys to your car. So you have, you know, you've got a car, you've got some car keys, but suddenly you wake up one morning and those car keys open a private jet. It's also yours. And you can go do an all, all kinds of other awesome stuff, totally off, off of the planet where you were building before, where you were adventuring before, but it's the same keys and the same privileges. And so that's why one thing I really want to highlight here that's super cool is that last fall, Ethereum Improvement Proposal 712 upgraded our keys so that now we can use the same keys we have from our wallet to sign off-chain data as well as on-chain data. Kind of like, you know, if you could imagine your car keys can now allow you to fly off the planet as well as drive on the planet. Um, and so <laughs> what this update means is that we only need to use one wallet to get started adventuring in Web3 on and off the chain. It used to be back in the day that you would need a separate native mobile application or a separate browser extension to be able to enjoy all this off-chain goodness. But now one set of keys, one data backpack, one wallet, all one experience. Hmm. I love this. How does this work with, okay, so... You know, the promise of Web3, of web I guess, is you have this one account. Typically, people say it's your one wallet, and you can then go and interact with the rest of the world, the internet, the digital world with it. But now we have things like ENS, which is like your new domain or your new name. And then now we have Lens Protocol with your Lens Handle, which is your new domain as well, but this is your social uh, domain. And now we have our Disco, don't, like, I don't know, our DID. I don't know if it has a name or something like that as well. But Will will basically I'll be able to tie my ENS and my lens handle all into my disco handle essentially, or how does how do they all work together? Exactly. So think of disco as the superset, the backpack okay. in which inside of which you carry all your stuff. Because you, like a disco ball, are a multifaceted human being. You present a different version of yourself. You may want to act a little bit differently. You may want to have different traits, share different parts of yourself in different contexts. So it is unreasonable to demand that you show up with the exact same version of yourself at, you know, at, at Sunday dinner with your grandparents and at 4 a.m. at a rave in Ibiza. Now, if you have that kind of continuity, we stand a consistent king. But for the rest of us who perhaps have different parts of ourselves that come to the fore in different situations, we need the flexibility and autonomy to decide how we want to show up. In mm. fact, if we look to data about Gen Z and how you know, younger people are using the internet, there is an outsized demand for anonymity and for the ability to create multiple pseudonymous personas so you can show mm. up as different parts of yourself in different contexts. Um, so with Disco, we empower you to choose how you wanna show up and to decide in what context you wanna share what parts of yourself. So I think defaulting to public is a very powerful tool, but at the same time, Web2 and the social e ecosystem in which we find ourselves is exhausting. The mm. performance of a curated self 24 seven on the internet, not only trains you know, bots to serve you up data that's not actually relevant to who you really are, just your performed self, but it also really messes with the boundaries of how close we think we are to people because of the intimacy with which we share our lives. And so platforms like Be Real that invite perhaps a greater, greater layer of authenticity, a little bit less curation are popping off and demand for showing up how you want to show up as opposed to how an app would prefer for you to be defined is gaining traction. Mm. 
I, this is all coming together. It makes so much more sense now to me. Uh, so I absolutely love this. Uh, Jay, I don't know if you have any more questions on like how it actually works, like we're going to, but I really want to get into like, I want to understand how we actually use this thing and like what it looks like in the future once it's fully built out. I want you to help us bake the cake, I guess, to go back to what we talked about at the beginning, but like when disco is fully live and we can talk about when that is um, in a second, but like, is this all, how do we control our data? Is it like in our wallet, there's going to be like a settings, like kind of like, you know, on my Facebook, I can choose my settings, uh, like my notifications and things. Like, is that where we're going to control all this data? Or like, how do you imagine, I don't know if that's fully built out yet, but like, how do you imagine that working for the user when it's fully built out and you're like, disco is everything you've ever wanted it to be? How are we going to actually use it? <laughs> this is an outstanding question because I think it is the part of the movie that we sometimes skip over in Web3. Hmm. The whole container for our adventures happens between the screen and our eyeballs. People eat with their eyes first. And so if we don't provide design and experiences that meet users where they are in their journey, instead of demanding that they come to step zero of our user journey, regardless of where they are, then we're going to have a bad time. Um, mm. And so with Disco, we care very deeply about integrating into user journeys and adventures that people are already going on, as opposed to trying to deviate them significantly into a new pattern that doesn't feel good. So you can think about Disco like a wallet for your wallet. Uh, for all your wallets, in fact, all your wallets, all of your accounts, all of your identities. And so um, a few weeks ago, when we started our private beta rollout, I invited about 100 of my friends who are not very Web3 native at all, many of them DJs, music managers, folks from festivals, um, not necessarily embedded in our uh, decentralized ecosystem. They downloaded their very first Web3 wallets at home. They visited disco.xyz, connected their wallets, created data backpacks, filled out a brief profile of self-attested credentials, credentials they've written about themselves that they can reuse in other apps. Um, upon completing this little onboarding adventure, I sent them a disco knot credential attesting to their official status. They sent me a GM, like a Facebook style poke. I could send one back to them. So now we have a way to flirt in web three for anyone keeping track at home. Um, <laughs> and then my friends were able to show up in person in Santa Monica at a live event, the Diplo crashed Hi Wes. And, um, they were able to pull up their data backpacks pull out their disco not credentials, present them to us. We were able to validate the cryptography with our own mobile devices from the disco team. We gave everybody disco balls. And as far as those friends are concerned, you don't need to fund a wallet. You don't need to put money in or perform KYC in order to use your MetaMask keys to take custody of a digital rectangle that you own about yourself and to show up at a party to use it to redeem for some awesome rewards. And so the experience of disco is supposed to illustrate all of the magic that we can enjoy with our private keys before we have to mess with the financial elements of it. So mm -hmm. I think we need web 2.1 before we need web 3.0 and non-financial onboarding with non-financial network effects, the ability for us to build reputation and bring our experiences from web two to web three in person. I think that's a pretty sweet way to go about it. Mm. So do I need a wallet? for this, like to, to use my um, DID, like I need a wallet or can you start without a wallet? So right now, the way that we've built Disco is just to, uh, to inform our understanding of non-financial network effects in the Ethereum ecosystem. So first we're starting off with users who have Ethereum keys, then we will roll in users who have other kinds of keys as a base layer. And then we're really excited to pursue a variety of different custodial solutions and key sharded solutions that allow you to show up without a wallet, but to still enjoy mm. all of the portability of self-custody. That's super cool. I love that. Sounds like a super fun party. This is amazing. Uh, I think like everybody wants to come to this party and be part of this. Um, so they're actually, that's, that's a, I think a really salient point here is that everybody needs account abstraction. Whether mm -hmm. you come from the Bitcoin world or the Polkadot world or the Solana mm -hmm. world or the Ethereum world, everyone is hitting a ceiling on how much fun we can have when the only thing we can do is push money back and forth at each other. And so, you know, I've gone to... Bitcoin maximalist, to Ethereum maximalist, mm -hmm. to Cardano enthusiasts. I had to go to Texas to find some of those and <laughs> propose the same approach to all of them. What if we create data backpacks, self-custody the information that we can carry with us from one context to another that we can build around our public addresses? And all of them told me 
you know what, this is the most important idea that I think my community could be working on right now. Mm. So my takeaway from that is that if we focus on adopting and embracing these specs in the communities where they make the most sense, we have common ground ahead. However, if we turn inward to ourselves, if we focus on our own networks alone and we ignore the fact that there is a thriving community of others outside who we could ally with, then we will lose out on the opportunity to unite the many tribes of Web3 and build a, you know, a more logical, interoperable, shared permissionless network. I, I'm kind of just, as you speak, I'm just imagining Disco as this sort of like spider web that's just going around and connecting all of the different layers and different chains and like parts of Web3 all into like one sort of one sort of layer, I guess. Is that is a fair uh, scenario or way to explain it? <laughs> I like that, but let's invert, let's invert the vision a little bit. Disco okay. is one giant dance floor and we are welcoming everybody onto the dance floor together no matter where you come from, the level of technical familiarity you have, how much money you have, how long you've been in this ecosystem, it does not matter because there is room for everyone to express their fullest selves at the disco. I think sometimes in Web3, we talk about the permissionless and accessibility of our networks, but we forget that token distribution is not as equal as access to protocols. And so the mm. power distribution that we have in Web3 is not actually as decentralized as we like to say. So mm -hmm. if we can invite a new plane where everyone has equal footing, where everyone has an equal chance to capture the non-financial value they bring to the table, I think this is the opportunity when we can start talking about things like banking the unbanked. We can start talking about solving human coordination problems with an emphasis on the human part. So let's, let's just break down then what, what do people do next? Like, how do we get involved with this? Uh, and you mentioned before that there was sort of three groups that we need to create this, this vision. Um, so and may, maybe, maybe you want to go through each of those groups. Um, but I think that, you know, everybody listening and I, myself as well, uh, I'm excited to support this vision of a universal standard of identity. Like I think that's what you've talked about this whole time. That's what we need. It's going to allow us all to come onto the dance floor, which is what we all want. We all want, <laughs> and, and it gives us all control in a way that we can, can share what we want to share when we want to share it. But, but how do we get there? Like, what are the next steps? And I don't mean necessarily Disco's next steps. Like, what are our next steps? What do you need the community to do? What do you need the users to do? What do you need the developers to do? Um, yeah. Well, this is exciting. All right, showtime, guys. So in terms of you know the next few months, a really exciting opportunity that we all have right now is to get ready and get aware. So while Disco is swiftly working on our initial testing, getting our user experience flow honed with our friends at Boys Club and Chi-Fi and a few other DAOs, um, I think this is a unique opportunity for us to pause and think, what else do we want? Why are we here? Hmm. I think often in Web3, we get really excited about the possibilities of what we could do with a technology when we discover it, when we get familiar with it, when we iterate upon it. But we don't often start at the end of the story and say, what is the outcome that we would like to create? And how do we work backwards from that outcome into the tools that are going to be best suited to bringing it into being? And so this is an opportunity for a mindset change for our ecosystem. Up to this point, we have not yet had ethical frameworks that we play inside of. We don't have rules in Web3 around where we build and what we design to minimize harm to human beings. We are just experimenting on the frontier, but it's time for us to grow up. So in the next few months, I think there's a unique opportunity for us to all contemplate what is the future that we are actually trying to build here? Because the consequences of our experimentation are becoming very real when we start mm -hmm. to play with the lives of human beings and their data, as we discussed earlier with women in Roe v. Wade in the United States. And so because our choices are becoming more consequential, we have a responsibility to design in a manner that is going to be you know, optimal for our users and minimize the harm that they befall as a result of interacting with our systems. So beyond mm -hmm. that, if you're excited about what we're building and you're ready to contemplate your responsibility in this space, I invite you 
to follow us on Twitter at Disco XYZ. I'm at Proven Authority. You can drop us a line at disco.xyz. Please tell me your dreams for the metaverse. I, re I actually read them all. I would love to understand the kinds of things that you would like to build with your data backpacks. And for those who are excited about joining us on the dance floor, getting your very own data backpacks, um, you'll be able to visit us at a few conferences later this fall. Um, and we'll also be rolling out, as I mentioned, with a handful of our communities, probably at some live events. So we want to be very careful about the way that we introduce these tools to the world, because it is important for us that we meet the needs of our users before we ask them to deviate from their every day. So I promise that we will only bring you a backpack when it is well suited to your needs. Um, and if you're interested in helping us test data backpacks and provide your feedback, we would love to know that too in, uh, in um, dropping us a line on Twitter or on our website. This, um, so by the way, we will put the uh, links to all that in the show notes. Everyone make sure you go you go follow uh, Evan on, on Twitter uh, and reach out to her. Uh, hopefully everyone here is disco pilled. I think that's the term you guys use. Uh, I'm definitely disco pilled. Jay, are you For disco pilled? Sure. 100%. <laughs> For sure. Um, I, I got to ask, and I know I, I feel like you kind of just said it, but does do you guys have like a roadmap? Like, is there a phased approach on where this is going? And maybe you can't talk about that and um, you kind of want to keep that hidden and that's fine if, if that's the case. But I'm just curious is like, do you guys have sort of a plan of how this is all going to unfold over the coming years? Or what are you guys thinking there at, at Disco? Alpha legal alert. So oh, here's the vibe. Yeah. Um, first, we are starting off by exploring non-financial network effects in the Ethereum ecosystem. So how can we enjoy network effects from apps where human beings are the physical transport layer for their data from app to app? Then we roll in other base chain ecosystems and we demonstrate cross-chain interoperability without bridges. Then we integrate Web2 capabilities where you are going to be able to package your data from Web2 for use in Web3, your credit score, your Uber rating, your maybe you don't want your Tinder rating or whatever, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, being able to package data from your life in Web2 for use in Web3 so that you can prove that you're not a bot so you don't have to fill out captures. So you can prove that you are um, an adequate passenger so your buddy will let you tag along for the road trip. Whatever these activities are, it's important for you to take the data that you had before you showed up to Web3 because you were a person before then um, and you have a lot of value that can, you can bring with you into the metaverse. Now, beyond that, uh, we we are thinking of first, of course, serving the communities in our Web3 ecosystem um, where we would like to give them an unfair advantage. So for teams like Boys Club and Shifi that don't have their own engineering squads, but still contribute an immaculate amount of vibes, education, and inclusiveness to our community, we think that it is awesome to give them an unfair advantage as we start out and we start exploring these capabilities. We want to make sure that the diversity of users we serve is reflected not only in the makeup of our team, Team, but the makeup of the folks who we test with. And so to ensure that we are not overrepresenting the groups that are already in power in crypto, we're being very careful about the partners that we choose as we roll up. Well, How big is Disco? We, How many people are working on this? Too. <laughs> so right now we have 16 Disco knots, but if you know any technical product managers, have them slide into my DMs. <laughs> see what we can see what we can do. We've got a pallet. Uh, talent collective. I'll see if there's any, uh, what was it? A technical product manager. That's what you need. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. See what we can do. Well, listeners, if you're a technical product manager, you get in there, you get in and, and working with disco, a disco knot. I love that. Yes. <laughs> and I feel like a big, a big part of this is, is education. You know, you're talking a lot about the need for us to slow down, to think about what we're doing. What is our intention? Why are we doing this? Uh, how, how are you guys tackling that? I mean, obviously coming on the podcast today, but I feel like you need to educate so many different layers of the ecosystem and so many different players, stakeholders within the ecosystem. Is, how, how is that going? Is, is there a plan to do that? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a big task, a big task. That's for sure you're, you're, you're taking on. Everywhere, all the time. So I was going to say that <laughs> the most important layer of education for us to get started is educating ourselves 
I think too often when we start to build and develop products, we build them for things that we want as individuals that we wish existed that we would like to use. But self-centered design is not a recognized design practice in most of the world. Mm -hmm. And so at Disco, we practice user-centered design. So our amazing full-time UX researcher, Carmen, leads the charge, making sure that we interact with users on a regular, indeed weekly basis, making sure we validate our assumptions, everything from the wording to the color, to the font choice, to how things are presented in sequence. Um, our amazing design practice led by my colleague Nue uh, ensures that you know, not a single one of our features and, and recommendations make it into the backlog to be built unless we can justify it against the needs of our users and validate it with an actual conversation or further data. Um, so at Disco, we make sure that um, as I mentioned, you know, the diversity of folks who are conducting research, who are filling out our to-do list, who are writing our code, who are testing it, who are marketing it, who are onboarding, reflect the diversity of users we hope to serve. So the diversity of our team is not just a nice benefit because we are mm -hmm. woman-led. It is a design hedge to optimize for the best product outcome. So similarly, we see an opportunity to have that broader conversation in circles in Web3, as well as throughout Web2, which is why our, um, you know, our universe of, uh, of companions and collaborators span the galaxy from mm -hmm. folks on other chains, folks in the regulatory and legal and political environment, folks in the fashion and connected hardware and autonomous vehicles and video game environments. So what we try to do is be a sponge to hear about the friction and agony that folks experience in their everyday lives when it comes to redundant data or personal data. So I know it seems like a lot of these different disciplines are very, very different, but at their core, it's the same thing over and over again. One party makes a statement, another party has to rely upon it, and someone mm -hmm. is sitting in the middle who that statement is written about. Well, kudos to the 17 disco knots that are tackling this massive issue and building, building a universal identity standard for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'm going to jump into a bit of a speed round. Uh, just some fun questions for you, Evan. Um, let's start with uh, what's one NFT that you'll never sell? So my good friend, Carson Woods, Carson Daly, as she is known online, did an amazing collection with a, a couple of other friends who are artists, Chad Knight and Parrot. Um, the collection is called NFT Affirmations. And I sweep the floor every chance that I get, but I love the <laughs> NFT affirmations because they remind me of early memes. Um, they're statements okay. like, you know, I am blockchain baby mama. I, people pay me to talk about the blockchain, like silly things like that. But, um, you know, on, on top of really incredible, beautiful art from some of my favorite artists before we were homies, they were, you know, heroes of mine. Um, and so I am, I especially love that collection because positive affirmations, I think are very powerful in our lives. We don't see a lot of them in the web three space, but I especially love gifting these affirmations to my friends who are new to web three mm. so that they can have a statement that resonates with them. That makes them feel powerful as they stride into this new space. Cool. I love that. Uh, What's the floor of those? I might have to pick me one up. Oh, you absolutely <laughs> should. Well, and everything's on sale this week anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, going back uh, to NFT NYC, what was your favorite favorite event or talk at that uh, at NFT NYC? My favorite event was hands down the Crypto Dick Butt Ball. <laughs> so, for those who may be unfamiliar with the future global reserve currency, Crypto Dick Butts. <laughs> Uh, were minted last summer and have developed quite the cult following among a number mm -hmm. of my friends. And so the high priestess of the crypto dick butts, also known as the chief strategy officer um, over at Coin, I believe Coin Shares, Meltem Demirers, who's you know one of the great icons of Web3, um, had a beautiful event where we wore gowns and capes and masks. The men were in black tie. There was a choreographed dance uh, um, depicting the lore and origin story and um, and uh, ritual of the crypto dick butts performed by a variety of ballerinas and orchestrated by a choreographer. Um, so that would definitely be my favorite. The crypto dick butts were minted on Spank Chain, right? Is that correct? <laughs> Hilarious. No, crypto dick butts are layer one Ethereum because they are yeah, mission critical. Mission <laughs> critical. But I'm sure I'm sure Amin Soleimani, creator of Spank Chain, probably owns it. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, there's just so much fun being had right now. Yeah. It's incredible. <laughs> Gotta have fun. Uh, okay. Um, two more questions. One thing you've bought recently for under $100 that has had an impact on you and it does not have to be web three related. Um, something I bought for, Oh, Oh my gosh. Um, I don't, I don't have them on me. I'll have to send you guys a link or something, but I found some really silly sunglasses that I wore to the Coachella music festival. They're like big round red sunglasses. Nice. And I got so many compliments that I thought these should be disco swag. And so I ordered them for everybody on my team and we've been using them <laughs> disco swag. Yes, Amazing. Love that. Amazing. <laughs> Uh, okay, last question. Um, if you had a billboard to get one message out to a billion people, Ooh. the whole world, what would you put on that billboard? It's a great question. Key rotation is the new hydration. Self-custody is self-care. <laughs> Key rotation yeah. is the new hydration. Self-custody is self-care. <laughs> Explain, explain it. what you mean by key rotation. Yeah, so changing your passwords, changing mm. out the address you have associated with your ENS, regularly rotating the security keys that you use to interact with your life. So actually I was chatting with some friends over at Goop, which is Gwyneth Paltrow's mega mm -hmm. brand. Um, and we were talking about digital wellness being a new category. We all know our physical wellness, spiritual wellness, sexual wellness, nutritional wellness, but do we know digital wellness? Mm -hmm. So in the same way that we have a 27 step skincare routine, we should also be thinking about, you know, what are the routines for our OPSEC that help mm -hmm. us feel safe and secure and good about ourselves? Wow. So important. Yeah. We talked about that a lot too. That's uh... girls have good OPSEC. <laughs> 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 oh my god uh, i love it i love it okay any any final words to share evan anything else you want to any show you want to make anything you want to share with our audience that they can do to support you Absolutely. So in addition to following us and dropping us your metaverse dreams, I also want to invite all female and non-binary listeners to come hang out with me at the boys club. We are a global community of female and non-binary people in web three. We've got a sweet discord channel, awesome events all over the world, regular town halls, a no stupid questions channel for all of those inquiries that you don't feel comfortable bringing to crypto Twitter. So I want to make sure that all of your listeners know that if there are people in their lives who are interested in exploring web three, but don't really know where to start, we would love to welcome them at boysclub.vip and i can just say i went to a boys club event at the permissionless conference uh, and it was awesome and i met uh, many from the boys club and just such a cool group of people and um the event was awesome so uh yeah i love boys club <laughs> vibes approved but yeah exactly <laughs> well evan thank you so much this was an incredible conversation i've been so excited to explore uh, what you're building and what you're doing for a while now. So it was uh, just super excited to get you on here and to, and to pick your brain because you have just so much knowledge going on in there. And uh, it was awesome to be able to just like be able to pull some of that out of your brain and, and be able to learn from it. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today. This was awesome. This has been super fun. Can't wait to see you guys on the dance floor. For sure. <laughs> And, so, and sorry to whoever you're late for your next meeting. I know we went a bit over, so thanks for hanging around. Uh, you know, we measure time and block height here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have a great day, Evan. Thanks so much. Thanks, friends. See you in the metaverse. Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy. We hope this helps you along your Web3 journey. If it does, please share this episode and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. By the way, if you have yet to join the Discord community, you are missing out. This is where all the magic happens. This is where we learn, where we ask questions, where we network. Uh, you want to be in there. The link to join is in the description below. And finally, a quick disclaimer. Nothing in this podcast was financial advice. Crypto and Web3 can be risky. You can literally lose it all. In fact, if you invest on account of what we say, you probably will lose it all. So don't do that. In all honesty, the point of this podcast is to remove the noise of markets and price and focus on utility and implementation anyway. So you should not take any of this as financial advice. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.